We're about to begin the mid-morning session. Um, this is the Precision Health Population Health and Health Disparities Panel. I'm Rachel Hess. I'm the Chief of the Division of Health System Innovation and Research at the University of Utah and have the privilege of um, introducing and then moderating the discussion for this panel. Precision Health has huge potential to support the health of populations looking at not only the genetic origins of disease um, but also the gene environment behavior interactions. It's essential that as we learn about and apply these um, techniques and knowledge that we also evaluate and attend to issues of disparities in race, ethnicity, economics, and geography. And I think we've heard that already in our talks today. And I, as I was listening to this morning, I just kept thinking, and the panel that I get to introduce does all of these things, which is super exciting. Um, it's really my privilege to introduce um, Dr. Chinita Hughes-Halbert, who holds the AT&T Distinguished Endowed Chair in Cancer Equity and is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Hughes-Halbert's um, research identifies sociocultural, psychological, genetic, and environmental determinants of minority health and health disparities, and then translates this information into interventions to improve equity among racially and ethnically diverse populations and other medically underserved groups. She earned her doctorate in personality psychology from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and completed pre- and postdoctoral training in cancer prevention and control at the Georgetown University Medical Center. I also learned that she was um, at the University of Pennsylvania around the same time that I was at Temple, so that was exciting. Same city, didn't know her. Um, Dr. Hughes Halbert is a nationally recognized expert in minority health and health disparities, and her research is supported by numerous R01s from the NCI as well as National Human Genome Research. Research Institute. She's the PI of an academic community partnership funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities to develop community-based interventions to improve health outcomes in African Americans. She has also been appointed by President Barack Obama to the NCI Board of Scientific Advisors and, this is so exciting, um, was recently elected to the National Academy of Medicine and is the first woman, and the first woman, the first African American from South Carolina to achieve that distinction. It's really my privilege to introduce her now. So, um, good, good, this is morning. Um, I'm still a little bit on East Coast time, so thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. I'm really um, excited and honored to be here. I, I was reflecting on the way here on the drive that I think this is my fourth time in uh, Salt Lake and maybe my second time coming to this conference, so it's really exciting to see uh, everyone here and see how much it's grown uh, since the first one where I had the privilege of presenting. Um, what I want to talk about today I think is really will resonate with many of you because we've already talked about several key issues related to minority health, health disparities, diversity, um, and how that all intersects and interplays in terms of how we think about different outcomes and the potential for precision medicine to either enhance um, and address disparities or actually make them worse. And what I wanted to do today is, is to share with you um, the way that we've been thinking about uh, precision medicine and minority health and health disparities as part of the uh, MUSC Transdisciplinary Collaborative Center in Precision Medicine and Minority Men's Health. Um, and to offer it as a framework or a model for how we might think about addressing precision medicine within the context of disparities. So um, the previous talks actually set up what I'm going to say very nicely um, and have already addressed some of the overarching issues related to uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. I'll just add that I was really excited by um, this announcement because it, to me, really spoke to the need to begin thinking about health and, and health disparities and the way we offer uh, clinical interventions, the way we offer public health interventions um, in a more integrated and holistic approach and that we can't just focus on genes, but that we have to think about genetic, environmental, and lifestyle variables as we think about providing individualized care. I think we were also excited about precision medicine because it provided an opportunity to promote equity uh, by, by race and ethnicity through individualized care that would be targeted to early detection, prevention, and treatment. We also know at the same time that there are many disparities and equities in the way in which care is delivered the, and the quality of care um, at various um, health care centers. And we know that there are disparities in access to public health interventions and 
and that can lead to differences um, in outcomes and, and differences in risk. So, you know, if we think about the overall vision for precision medicine, and one of the things that I think is really exciting is that there's so many technological advances, but we really begin to have to think about, well, what is the long-term implications if those types of advances don't really make it into the clinical settings where minority populations are most likely to receive care. So while there's the, certainly the potential for precision medicine to address disparities by offering individualized approaches, it will only get to that place if those interventions and those strategies are actually implemented in those settings and um, are implemented from uh, an informed evidence base. We've heard a lot today about the lack of diversity of the studies that are being conducted to understand and identify genetic risk factors. And that's one of the things that we gave particular attention to as we began thinking about, well, how can we, be how can we address a precision medicine uh, you how can we address disparities from a precision medicine approach? The first thing I think we had to do is take a more holistic view of determinants of minority health and health disparities. And what I'm showing you now is a conceptual model which identifies all of the variables or many of the important variables that we need to think about within the context of minority health and health disparities. So as a behavioral scientist, I have focused primarily on um, individual risk be, uh, risk behaviors and social relationships and the social context, but that certainly isn't enough. Um, and we've heard that message uh, repeatedly today, and I think it's one that we need to continue to hear, that, but that we had to think about biological and genetic pathways, and we have to think about that within the context of overall social policies and conditions. So that we really have to have a, a, an, a, a a more robust way of integrating information from all of these different determinants to understand how they manifest in terms of the disparities in risk and outcomes and how we can use that to provide and develop individualized approaches to care. So we were really excited when the opportunity came about, um, I guess three years ago now, uh, to think about and establish a, a transdisciplinary collaborative center in precision medicine um, and minority and health disparities. And we uh, focused on minority men's health for several different reasons, and this shows you um, so our overarching mission is really to begin thinking about and creating a national consortium for integrating and engaging uh, diverse stakeholders in uh, precision medicine and health disparities research. This really builds upon the, the, policy, the perspective that my work and uh, the work of others has taken that you know, we really had to engage with clinicians, community partners, public health providers, as well as patients as we think about developing clinical interventions and strategies. Uh, we were also very interested in one of the key goals of our center is to conduct translational research to really understand the ways in which uh, social, uh, biological, psychological, behavioral, and clinical factors intersect or interact to uh, lead to disease outcomes in minority men. Um, and then lastly, if we think about translational research, we wanted to address one of the things I think uh, Dr. Corey mentioned was facilitating the dissemination and implementation of our evidence um, to actually enter practice. And then lastly, again, sort of thinking about novel models for integrating this information. So um, we were fortunate enough to be one of five centers funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, as well as the National Cancer Institute to embark on, um, to establish this center that focuses on minority men. One of the things that I, I'll just take a moment to do is say is that we really focused on minority men because at the time when we were writing our application, there were so many things that were happening to minority men, to African American men, just sort of in the public national sphere, and we were like, well, this is really an understudied population when it becomes when it comes to uh, health risk and disease outcomes, and we felt that um, this would be an opportunity for us to really give some shine a light and uh, address these issues in a more robust way. 
So what I'm showing you now are our academic partners. Um, it builds a lot upon the academic community partnership that I established when I was at Penn. Um, I tell my Penn colleagues that I just won't ever let them go no matter where I am. Uh, so they are actively engaged in this, um, as well as Hampton University, which is a historically black college located in Hampton, Virginia. And then uh, the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio is, um, is also one of our academic partners. In addition to our academic uh, collaborators and partners, we also work with several uh, community-based organizations that include the Low, Low Country Area Health Education Council, which uh, plays a key role in disseminating uh, educational interventions throughout um, uh, South Carolina. Uh, we also partner with the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer, um, which is really focused on developing community-based education programs for cancer prevention and control. Uh, the HOPE Institute has a priority and focus on addressing ethical, legal, and social issues with respect to minority recruitment and participation in across the research enterprise. And then lastly, the Southeast Health Equity Council has a focus on addressing uh, issues related to social determinants of health uh, across the southeastern part of the United States. So all of this, um, and I'll show you in just a moment how we're organized um, in terms of our cores and projects, but again you can see that we've brought together a diverse group of academic and community stakeholders to really uh, uh, address the issue of minority health and health disparities. <coughs> The other thing that we thought of as we were developing our center is that, you know, where should the disease, what, what type of disease should we focus on? Uh, once we made a decision to address issues specific to minority men, um, there are many uh, disparities among men in terms of chronic disease risk and outcomes. And so our thought process and why we focused eventually on prostate cancer um, was because that we wanted to address a disease that has a significant clinical and public health impact. You heard from the previous pr presenter about the um, significance of prostate cancer uh, nationally. We also wanted to address a condition that was a priority for community residents and other stakeholders. We learned uh, through our academic community partnership that prostate cancer and cancer prevention and control in general is a priority among among African American residents. And then lastly, to begin identify a condition where there is um, public health relevance and clinical and biological implications uh, to other chronic conditions. So we've been working in the area of prostate cancer for a number of years, um, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of, of our findings which sort of sh uh, steered us in the direction of, of targeting and addressing prostate cancer as part of our translational research. First is that when we think about prostate cancer screening, and we heard the, um, I guess the shifting um, got the evidence for recommendations from about prostate cancer screening. We were interested in this uh, particular set of studies in understanding whether or not men had ever had a prostate cancer, had ever had a PSA screening, um, and then whether or not they were sort of the variables that we know are important to inform decision making um, are associated with ever or annual or annual use of prostate cancer screening. And what we found through this work was that really uh, men weren't uh, the, the things that we think about, knowledge, um, patient-physician communication, and other variables that are important to inform decision making really weren't associated uh, very strongly with whether or not men had ever had a screening test or if they had um, used it in the past year. And then if we think about among men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, one of the issues that we found is that certainly there are racial differences in quality of life following diagnosis um, and that men are likely to experience um, specific psychological side effects such as um, making active attempts to avoid cancer related thoughts and feelings or on the opposite side of continuum experiencing intrusive thoughts about it, that there is this uh, sort of stress response and men's perceived level of stress was important to both their quality of life following their diagnosis as well as their, their uh, psychological reactions to um, being diagnosed with prostate cancer. So as we started thinking about this, you know, it really led us down a road of thinking about, well, there's a, a broader spectrum, a broader context, and to put it within the, the, the 
the social context within which minority men live, uh, we know that there are several acute and chronic stressors that affect minority men. Uh, you just have to look in the newspaper um, to see those or, or listen to the news or get on Twitter, whatever, social media, to understand that there are some very specific experiences that minority men have that result in uh, stress. We also know that um, these experiencing these social and psychological stressors uh, have an impact on biological functions and biological processes that are relevant to uh, the, the extent to which diseases um, are initiated and their progression. So we um, also know, again, from the literature that uh, there's different markers that can be used as a way to understand uh, the extent to which being exposed to different psych social and psychological stressors uh, impact biological functioning. This uh, marker is called allostatic load, and it's a, a measure of biological dysregulation in response to uh, experiencing social or so psychological stress. There are significant racial disparities in allostatic load. But even though there's been a lot of studies which have characterized the extent to which blacks and whites, um, both men and women, differ in terms of all allostatic load, we really don't have a very good understanding of the extent to which um, allostatic load or the effects of allostatic load on disease processes and outcomes. And that provided the, as you can see here, provided the overarching framework for our center. So I want to take you now through project one, through the projects in our center, and I think they really address um, key critical events along the in sequence from diagnosis, um, treatment, um, and long-term survivorship. So project one um, is focused on understanding the effects of stress reactivity um, to the development of an, of an anti-tumor response, immune response among uh, men who are, um, are at high risk for experience scene of recurrence and who are also participating in a prostate uh, vaccine clinical trial. Um, and this study, um, I think, is a really novel approach to understanding the ways in which stress reactivities reactivity was to a social stressor is, is going to impact immune functioning. The second project is related to early detection, and the project leader, Richard Drake, is using imaging to identify um, glycan panels that, uh, and, immune, and immune markers that are important and that are different between blacks and white men who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And we also want to look at the association between um, tissue and serum uh, immune and inflammatory signatures on disease progression between African American and white men. And then lastly, to look at the ways in which social factors, particularly stress, um, is related to um, prostate cancer biomarkers and immune functioning among uh, black and white men. And this study um, is using a, uh, a retrospective design in which uh, tissues from our biorepository are being included in some of the imaging work that Dr. Drake is conducting. Um, and we're at the same time doing a social determinants assessment among those men to be able to link their social data with their, um, with their imaging data, uh, particularly as a relationship relates to uh, immune and inflammatory signature markers. And then the last project uh, focuses on vitamin D and whether or not the extent to which vitamin D uh, supplementation results in differences in gene expression uh, in prostate tissues between African American and white men. And then to look at whether or not, whether or not um, genes in, uh, involved in the uh, HPA axis are expressed differently between um, African and, and white men and whether or not these differences uh, are important to the effects of vitamin D supplementation. We also have a consortium core which provides um, the over for the overall strategic um, direction for the center. Um, they also, as part of that, uh, have implemented and managed a pilot research program that um, is, is designed to expand our scope uh, beyond prostate cancer because we know that there are many diseases that are, that are common and for which minority men experience disparities. Um, and then they also are working, partnering with our implementation core to develop ways to translate findings from our research into clinic and community-based efforts. 
one of the things that we've done as part of the consortium core is begin to think about how we want to define precision medicine. And but this was actually a, um, a, an interesting process to go through because it involved our academic partners who had some peripheral knowledge about precision medicine, as well as our, our community partners who had even less knowledge about precision medicine. And this was useful, this was a useful exercise to go through because it really sort of set the stage for our um, operational definition of precision medicine and how we would present the work that we're doing to other uh, stakeholders in the public health sphere or in the community setting. So this is our, op our definition of precision medicine that we've adopted from our, uh, in the overarching center. Uh, I wanted to share with you some of the examples of the pilot research programs that were recently selected. Um, one, again, is sort of expending, extending the work that we're doing in prostate cancer. This is an investigator at Hampton University who is looking at um, mechanisms involved in reactions to um, radiation therapy. And then Bridget um, Bronner, who is a, um, she's actually a physician, not a PhD, um, is looking at uh, cardiovascular disease risk among young uh, African American men. And looking at the effects of physical of physical activity intervention. So our implementation core was established really to be the leaders in thinking about ethical, legal, and social issues related to uh, linking and integrating data related to biological, social, and clinical variables, um, and also to develop and implement and evaluate ways of disseminating this information to different uh, stakeholder groups. And then, <coughs> firstly, to begin thinking about what are the needs and priorities around precision medicine and the capacity to adopt precision medicine strategies across our consortium. So one of the um, things that we have completed recently is we um, have started collecting data to um, understand um, needs and priorities and interest in precision medicine. Um, among uh, patients who are enrolled in our study, and this will be implemented in our internal medicine practice. One of the things that I think is really interesting at this point, just among men who are enrolled in our sample project two, as just a reminder, the men who've been diagnosed in project three are, uh, are men who are from the VA and who have um, undergoing a prostate biopsy. And actually what we found is that men have very limited exposure to anything related to precision medicine. The first one, uh, the dark blue bars uh, in project two is showing that 31% um, had, had, had read or heard a lot about precision medicine and it was only 22% among men in project three. And despite this, um, men in both groups have fairly positive attitudes about precision medicine. So they think that uh, it will be, um, will help to improve their medical care, that it should be used as the basis for uh, medical treatment, um, and that precision medicine uh, should be used to personalize medical care. And at the, in terms of negative, we saw limited low levels of endorsement of negative um, expectations about precision medicine in terms of limiting um, access to medical treatment or not making any difference in uh, people's lives. So I think there's an opportunity to begin, to begin thinking about ways that we can develop educational strategies to help individuals understand uh, what precision medicine is and the ways in which it will or will not uh, improve their medical care. This is an example of our Evidence Academy. We had our first one um, last November. We were really excited that John Carpton came and spoke to us about um, population and tumor heterogeneity in the cancer genome and ways to use that um, as part of precision oncology. And the Evidence Academy is a relatively novel approach for disseminating information. The goal behind an Evidence Academy is to address a particular topic and engage multiple stakeholders in the process of thinking about, well, how would you um, implement or address this, or this particular practice in your setting? So it has a real world component and that it's not just talking in the abstract, but it's really getting people to begin thinking about if what, were the st what are the steps that you'd have to do to implement this into your a realm of care. So this first uh, precision medicine was really an orient this first uh, evidence academy, rather, rather, was really an introduction to precision medicine, our center, and began thinking about and identifying some of the issues that we need to be thinking about as a center as we move forward with, um, as we generate new findings and begin thinking about developing recommendations. 
So we have a data integration core. I've mentioned that one of the key focal points of our center is integrating data. We're very fortunate at MUSC to have a very strong bio, biomedical informatics uh, core that works across the campus to develop strategies for integrating um, if, uh, medical information uh, using the electronic health record. So the goals for our um, data integration core are shown here. One of the things that we're really excited about is the using of natural language processing based tools to be able to extract data on social determinants, social stressors from the clinician's notes and to um, integrate these information with clinical data uh, in the I2B2 environment. And we're excited by this because one of the things that we realized, um, and I think I realized this more so, uh, many of the instruments that we use to uh, understand stress and psychological responses are fairly lengthy. Um, given that and the constraints of the clinical uh, environment and, we, and not wanting to implement anything that will have an adverse effect on the clinical workflow, we wanted to be able to understand how our stress and stress-related issues discussed in in the clinical, uh, clinical in the clinical realm, are they documented in the clinical notes, and does it match up with things that we know are um, validated constructs related to stress and stress reactivity? So that we begin to think about developing tools that will help clinicians um, as to be able to address social determinants. So um, we have um, embarked on establishing our NLP processes, our na natural language processing. This just shows you the, the flow of how information starts with the clinical notes, creating a test set and a training set. Um, we've developed some of the NLP lexicon and pipelines, and we're now beginning to assess um, the performance of, our, of those uh, precision and, and recall. Um, one of the things that are the leaders of our data integration core has been really thinking about, well, how, how is stress addressed within the, um, within the electronic health record? And one of the things that we realize is that um, there is no ICD-9 code to say, well, someone is stressed out or not stressed out um, or experiencing stress. And stress can be defined in a lot of different ways, um, just using our self-report measures. Um, but there are... Um, some work has been done by the American Stress Association to begin thinking about different concepts, key variables that we need to begin thinking about. So we've come up with three domains to detect stress, as you can see here. One is like just being stressed, and these are the terms that we've used, uh, mental stress and then stress symptoms. What we found thus far, and uh, this, I'm really excited by this, is that 75% um, of of the, um, the, of the clinical notes that we've included in our test set have at least um, one stress mention identified from the note. So this is an issue that is being discussed and described within the clinical sphere. But there are a lot of different terms for um, how stress can be represented. So we're now beginning to call this information down even, even further, and our next step will be to understand the ways in which the, the discussions and mentions of stress are correlated or associated with um, levels of stress among men who are actually participating in our studies and have provided data on their perceptions of stress um, across a multiple domains. So the last um, pieces of information that I wanted to share with you is from Project 3, which is again using RNA sequencing to understand the ways in which genes uh, are maybe differentially expressed uh, between African Americans and whites. And this builds upon um, a, a significant amount of work that's been done in the area of vitamin D and racial disparities and vitamin D and uh, prostate cancer initiation. Uh, certainly the work of Dr. Kittles, who's going to be speaking next. Um, and uh, a colleague at MUSC, Sebastiano Catonicelli, who's been really um, interested in prostate cancer and vitamin D and, and the potential to use vitamin D as a way to slow the progression of low-risk disease. So what we found um, using our RNA sequencing is that um, there are uh, a, a number of genes that are uh, different, differentially expressed between um, blacks and whites um, at uh, a significant uh, uh, false detection rate, uh, in the, and this is in the prostate. 
Um, this is just uh, showing the point that there are and continues to be significant racial disparities in circulating levels of vitamin D um, and that this is important to prostate cancer biopsies. And some of the work that Sebastiano has demonstrated is that uh, supplementing men uh, who are uh, with who, um, who have been diagnosed with low risk disease, that they, um, it actually reduces the number of positive uh, cores uh, at subsequent biopsy. And these are among men who have low risk disease. So I really think that this could be a powerful intervention for those men who, you know, maybe who I think certainly want to have some sort of intervention, but surgery um, is not the, may not be the appropriate strategy for them. Um, and so what this uh, next slide is showing is that we see a set of, of genes that are differentially expressed uh, between whites and blacks, but also a set of genes that are exclusive to vitamin D status, which, are sh which is shown here in the, uh, the top Venn di diagram. And we were interested um, in this as it relates to the overlap in uh, prostate cancer disparities. So as you can see here, many of the, um, many of these um, of these transcripts are related to um, uh, to the immune functioning, but we were excited to see that um, there's a signal reflecting uh, a molecular stress response. And I think this is really exciting because one of the overarching questions around disparities is that if you think about that initial diagram, that there's the social context, there's social um, psychological stressors, but the question becomes, well, how, do, how does that manifest itself biologically? And this suggests that there is sort of a biological manifestation uh, of some of those stressors. This has, been, uh, this has been shown in previous work, so we feel like we're um, we're, we're on sort of a novel uh, path, a novel approach that we can be able to, where we'll be able to add significantly to the literature, particularly as it relates to racial disparities. Um, and then this next, this next slide shows um, comparing African Americans who were insufficient uh, versus sufficient in terms of transcripts. And one of the things that um, I think is really novel is that we see that uh, there's this uh, neurogenesis response that is really, that is emerging as an important issue uh, in the development of prostate cancer. So again, some really novel, interesting findings that are being generated just by having a more diverse uh, sample. Well, I should say that this comes from the VA sample uh, where we have like 50-50 um, blacks and whites who are enrolled in our study. So I think we do have done a really um, fantastic job of ensuring that there's adequate uh, representation of both groups uh, in the study population. So that's the sort of, I've shown you information that, was, that relates to biological stress and a biological stress response. And what I'm sh gonna show you now are sort of how men are thinking about and responding to their disease in terms of their uh, perceived level of stress. And, and this is data that comes from uh, men who are in our retrospective cohort. Um, and these are men who were diagnosed between three and five years prior. What's interesting to me is that 59% of men say that they're still experiencing some stress around their prostate cancer diagnosis, close to 60% say that they're experiencing some stress. 40% um, are experiencing stress related to their treatment decisions. 44% are experiencing stress related to treatment related side effects. And then about a third are still experiencing stress related to uh, talking with their family um, and dealing with the familial impact of their diagnosis. And so it suggests that, you know, diagnosis and treatment is certainly has a long-term consequence in terms of men's psychological responses. And then lastly, um, we were interested in financial toxicity and perceived stress and whether or not there are racial differences in these two uh, really important markers. Um, financial toxicity has gained in importance, uh, with certainly within the context of cancer because we know that cancer Cancer is a very uh, expensive disease to treat and it can have significant uh, adverse financial impacts uh, on uh, the patient as well as the family. And so using a measure of financial toxicity, what we found is that African American men, and these again are long term uh, survivors, still re African American men report significantly greater levels of financial toxicity uh, compared to white men. And there are small uh, differences when it comes to just perceived levels of stress. So as we move forward, one of the things that we want to do is begin to understand and link our data on uh, social and psychological stressors with our biological and genetic data to get a better, more robust understanding of how all of these uh, variables interact and, and are associated with disease risk and outcomes.
I'll end just by acknowledging um, the wonderful group of collaborators who are working as part of the center. Um, it's been a fantastic experience uh, partnering with, the, with this group to begin thinking about uh, precision medicine as a way to address disparities. Thank you. So just a reminder, we're going to hold questions until the panel portion of the discussion, which will be soon. Um, so I might, whoa, that moves. Um, so our next, our next um, speaker is Dr. Rick Kittles. He's professor and founding director of the Division of Health Equities within the Department of Population Sciences at the City of Hope. He's also the director of health equities at the Comprehensive Cancer Center. And on a personal note, he is um, one of Dr. Adam Bress's mentors, which is how I got to know him. Dr. Kittles is well known for his research of prostate cancer and health disparities among African Americans. His research is focused on understanding the complexities, the complexities surrounding race genetic ancestry and health disparities. He received a PhD in bio biological sciences from George Washington University. Over the last 20 years, he has been at the forefront of the development of ancestry informative genetic markers and how genetic ancestry can be quantified and utilized in genomic studies on um, disease risk and outcomes. His work has shown the impact of genetic variation across populations in um, pharmacogenomics, biomarker discovery, and the disease gene mapping. Um, Dr. Kittle's work has been funded by the National Institute of Health, and we'll pick up a little bit on the 25 vi um, hydroxyvitamin D issues. In 2010, these are exciting, he was also named Ebony Magazine's um, the Ebony Power 100 and um, was pre um, presented the keynote address at the United Nations General Assembly International Day of Remembrance of Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, which is like speaking at the UN must just be amazing. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to him. All right, thanks. thanks. All right, so the, uh, the title of this, this uh, symposium is The Future, right, of, uh, well, I didn't know this moved, The Future of uh, Precision Medicine, right? All right, so these are, these are interesting times. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I perceive the future to be in the context of, of communities that uh, 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 are, are, are disparate in terms of uh, health outcomes and also uh, access and um, opportunities. And so uh, maybe I'll <clears throat> provide some insight in, in that context. Um, also, I have a slight cold, and today's my birthday. And <laughs> <laughs> my daughter is extremely mad at me. I'm going to try and hurry up and get this out the way and then call her. Uh, she's like, why are you in Utah? <laughs> Daddy has to work, you know, so. All right, so. Um, these are interesting times, very exciting times, because science and technology is pushing us and pushing us into spaces and places that uh, 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 folks like myself get excited about, but also creates tension, uh, interesting tension uh, and frustration among some, because you sort of have to reconcile what you thought you knew with the new science and the technology. And then at the same time, you want to provide some new insight, you know, it's like a new lens, right? So you're saying, okay, I'm going to provide better uh, treatment options or opportunities or, or, or the like, and, and sometimes you can't really reconcile because we're asking pretty much the same questions, which is the new technology. And then also, um, <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> I love this slide because what it says is most of the genetic variation when you look at it across the world, human populations, it's centered around African descent populations. And it doesn't matter what genes or pathways you look at or whatever, there's enormous variation in African populations. And for so long, we've ignored that. And so lately, there's been this, oh, we need to catch up. And we need to catch up because we know a lot about Europe and, and, and some about Asia, but very little about Africa. But what's fascinating, when you look at this Venn diagram, is that half of that variation in Africa is exclusive to African populations. Now, if you are trying to leverage in terms of resources to gain information that you can use in some, um, um, uh, uh, some discipline like precision medicine, you'd want to definitely include African populations in that. So genetics obviously is, is, is driving a lot of this precision medicine 
um, in terms of diagnostics. The low-hanging fruit has and continued, will continue to be pharmacogenetics. Uh, but risk assessment and risk modification is fastly uh, um, emerging as important and insightful. And this is where diverse populations come in. Because when we look across the board at incidents and, and outcomes of, of many of these diseases, let's say, for instance, prostate cancer, what we see is that there's some differences there. There are subgroups that need special attention. Can we all agree on that? How do we identify those groups? Risk stratification. And a lot of times it's development of biomarkers that allow you to say this group of people need to be, um, um, uh, need to be screened more, just, uh, or, or uh, much more aggressively. Because, you know, this is that disease process, right? Typically the intervention is late in the game. We want to bring that in earlier. We want to intervene earlier. And this is where the genomics and the, and the uh, knowledge base in terms of um, uh, biomarkers can help us. So what are some of the, uh, what's the state of the science in the gaps? We have this era of precision medicine taking an active role in clinical decision making. However, it may increase disparities because this stuff costs money. In fact, it costs a lot of money. If you could just look across some of these major institutions, not all institutions are doing this because it's an investment. It's a big investment. And so you have the financial barrier, but then you have the information barrier too because most of the information continues to be based on populations of European ancestry. And you could go through the literature and see. I mean, folks have been writing about this, this, this lack of diversity in these trials, lack of diversity in these GWAS and NGS studies. It's gonna come back to haunt us in ways that are gonna be compounded later. Because this is continuing to move. We're gonna continue to move this you know what I'm saying? The science is moving, the technology is moving, and uh, um, without this information uh, of non-European populations, there is going to be a bigger rift. So, <laughs> we, we don't want this to continue to happen. <coughs> some of the problems, though, is when we think about, we think about the variance of unknown significance, um, and there was some discussion earlier about that, in particular, precision oncology, right? Uh, the BRCA mutations, and uh, things haven't changed much still with that. I think that some of the strategies could be sharing of some of these databases across institutions because we have these, these isolated areas where maybe there's a large clinical population of Hispanic women or African American women. And so some of these institutions have some of this data that could be used to, be, um, to, to, to study some of these outcomes. Merge all that data together to, give a, to, to provide a better story because it is sad when one thinks about the stress some of the women and men have who undergo some of these, uh, uh, these cancer um, uh, genetic tests. And they come back and they're upset because their physician or the genetic counselor says, we have a list of these variants of unknown significance. We can't tell you the impact of that. Not only were, they, had, were, there, were their anxiety high during that testing process, their anxiety becomes higher because they feel like it's a waste of time and, and money. How useful is this? And this is where I said it's going to come back to haunt us later on. If we do not take it, um, um, uh, try to correct this uh, uh, now, because there will be a growing population of folk who say, who will say that there's, there's no utility in precision medicine for me. We have misclassification of, of, part, of, of path, uh, pathogenetic variants, um, uh, mainly because of inadequate patient samples and the lack of diversity. A lot of times, many institutions just grab whatever samples they have that are non-white, pull them all together, and treat them as if they're all the same. And, and we can't do that, we know that. We can leverage ancestry, genetic ancestry, in these diverse populations to really help us, help inform us of the uh, genetic components of, uh, or, of, of, of disease. And so there have been some studies that have shown this, um, why it's insightful and important for using diverse populations in some of these trials and, and, um, and, and, uh, and genetic studies. 
But what I find fascinating, this goes back to this issue of Africa, is when we look at the contribution of rare variation in, in, in prostate cancer heritability, and this was a, a cool study where they sequenced um, across um, uh, many of these um, uh, GWAS hits for prostate cancer in, in uh, 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 th these uh, global populations, right? found an enormous number of these rare variants, not surprising, in African descent populations, almost double what we find in some of the other populations. Um, a similar sort of uh, representation of common variants, which we all know. But when we look at the heritability of these, of these rare variants, um, the, the uh, African populations and Asia population we see is, is, um, is pretty high, the, the heritability given the rare variant uh, component. Um, but we see this sort of similarity among those common variants. This is also something that we have to take into account too. Now, why is all of this important? Because if, if, if we're really going to try to um, uh, use or leverage precision medicine to eliminate disparities, we're going to have to move away from this whole issue of race in our studies altogether. Because we're looking at things at the individual level now, right? So we have to try to move away from race and look at ancestry. Uh, uh, race historically has been this crude proxy for some shared biology, shared environment, and this interaction that impacts on disease. But we're moving away from race now, using ancestry to say something about the individual's genetic background and measure the environment in better ways. We look at ancestry, and in terms of disparities, we know that communities of color, biologically diverse, we can use or leverage genetic ancestry to uncover the genetic structure at the individual and population level, and it varies geographically and socially across the, the country. I, I love to show this plot because what it represents are, is these black dots are African Americans, the white dots are, are whites, um, and the distribution in genetic ancestry um, in, in, these, in these populations. And it allows us to say, hey, you know, there is no dividing line here in terms of your genetic background of who's white who's black, it's about how you were socialized, how you were raised, and how you identify yourself. It has significant meaning. You know, like Tiger Woods is in there, he says he's Cablasian, right? He's not black, white, or Asian, he's Cablasian. And so uh, we, we, we are learning to appreciate that diversity, that spectrum of genetic background that's represented um, in, in, the, uh, in this uh, melting pot we call the United States. Why is it a melting pot, Adam? <laughs> Adam's looking at me. Because genes don't stay in your genes. That's why. <laughs> you bring any groups together, <laughs> they're going to be mixing. It's going to be mixing. And so there is no sort of this homogeneous uh, uh, groups of, of blacks or whites. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is really cool stuff because we can use ancestry to really um, deconstruct race, but also to really say something about family history and genetic background. You know, he, these groups, NIH says, pull them together in your tables, your enrollment tables, because they speak Spanish, right? Puerto Rican and Mexicans, uh, Americans, but genetically have pretty different distributions in, let's say, African and, and Native American genetic ancestry. And so those patterns could actually impact your trial or, you know, if there's a genetic component to what you're studying. And so you should take that into account and leverage it in your analysis. And that's what th folks have started doing now, and it's, it's provided a lot more um, power and insight in these studies. Now, anybody familiar with these? This is my uh, genome, my chromosome painting from 23andMe. I'm trying to preempt the next session on, uh, <laughs> on DTC. But this is my genome, right? And the reason I'm bringing this up is to show you that while I'm not 100% Mandingo, um, I do have significant proportions of European ancestry on some of these chromosomes. But chromosome 15 is all African. I have African alleles across that entire chromosome, and there are important genes on the chromosome, like the two biggest predictors of skin color. And so I have the African alleles for, those, uh, for SLC24A5 and OCA2. Do you see what I'm saying? So we can leverage this for understanding our ancestral background in terms of the contribution of certain traits, but also risk for disease. Admixture mapping allowed us to focus on chromosome 8 for prostate cancer, 8Q24. 
the biggest predictor of risk for prostate cancer, not just in African Americans, across the, uh, across the world. We see it in Asians, we see it in Indians, we see it in Europeans. The same locus, the most replicated locus for, for risk. So let's talk about prostate cancer real quick. Earlier, there was a discussion about PSA testing and the controversy. One of the most highly contentious biomarkers in the history of humanity is PSA. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, folks have said for a long time, you're, uh, let me be let me rephrase this, because there's probably urologists in here. I don't want you guys yelling at me, throwing anything at me. But it is controversial. And for a long time, many urologists have said that we should have race-specific cutoffs for PSA. Because as a biomarker, it behaves differently between blacks and whites, right? Long discussion. There are many studies where folks have looked at PSA in high-risk populations and shown that if you self-report as white, there's a predictive um, probability there that's different than those who self-report as black. In fact, we, we've shown that uh, in, our, in, a, in a study that uh, we did with folks at uh, um, Fox Chase, where the self-reported whites, the predictive value, I mean, the prediction for prostate cancer at various cutoffs is vastly different than what we saw for African Americans. We then said, okay, well, let's see if this is genetic. And so we stratified the African Americans based on West African genetic ancestry, low, medium, and high, and found, yes, we saw this pattern, this correlation of higher African ancestry, higher prediction for prostate cancer with PSA. And so what the, what the urologists were saying for the last 20, 30 years may actually have some genetic component to it. And yes, there is this increased burden among African Americans that may just be due to uh, inheritance of these risk alleles at a higher frequency because of the West African um, uh, uh, ancestry. I wanted to show this. This is work that uh, we di I did with Adam. Um, we were in Chicago. We got access to a smoking a cessation trial uh, data uh, where they showed using naltrexone that those who self-reported as white and black, uh, naltrexone behaved differently. Uh, black, whites responded, but African Americans didn't. So then we said, all right, well, let's get some DNA from these guys and type ancestry, stratify the African Americans, uh, low West African ancestry, high West African ancestry, and found that, so if you look at the pool African American sample, there was, uh, in terms of four week quit rate, there was no significant difference between naltrexone and the placebo. But for those with low West African ancestry, they behaved just like, they responded just like whites did in terms of uh, uh, the response to naltrexone, while those with high West African ancestry did. Now, you're saying, wow, this is so cool. What does it have to do with precision medicine? What this is doing is it allows us to say this has a strong genetic component where ancestry is a part of it. And we can now move from that to the individual level and look at those genotypes that are important. And that's what we did. We said, oh, let's look at some of these genes. And it was the mu opioid receptor. There's some variants there that are functional. That are, um, uh, that are associated with West African ancestry uh, at a higher frequency, and that's why we see sort of uh, what we see among those with West African descent. I mean, uh, high West African ancestry. Now, this is important because, you know, it's, when I say it's important, it's not like that impactful because naltrexone nobody uses it anymore, right? But it is, it's a useful model to say this is how we should move forward with some of this stuff because a lot of times we're, we're, we're asking these questions in a very heterogeneous uh, uh, pool of, uh, of data points. So this was what I found interesting. Earlier this week, um, uh, Healthcare Information and Management Systems uh, uh, Society said that uh, uh, molecular diagnostics technology is number five on the list of 10 technologies that hospitals are most likely to make a first-time investment in, in 2018. Now, when it, this is the clinical um, uh, molecular, uh, the, these are the molecular path labs that are doing a lot of this precision medicine in these hospitals. But the barriers consistently are gonna be com com uh, computing and data requirements and money. And so just think about the lay of the land and how inequitable it is in terms of uh, uh, the economics and the finance. And which hospitals and which communities are gonna get access to this or be able to utilize this, this science. And so that's what, that's what gets me up in the morning is trying to uh, make sure that, the po that all populations benefit um, from, this, from this science. 
I mean, it's so important because I think it's going to be impactful, number one. And if it, but if it's not um, equally distributed across all communities and populations, there will be opportunities of increased disparities. So anyway, attention must be paid to increasing diversity in uh, genomic medicine implementation. Identify barriers and develop aggressive strategies. You cannot, you know, uh, 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 hold hands and sing kumbaya and think it's going to change. You got to be straight up and very aggressive and, and just be honest. Is it, is it worth the investment in this community? Equitable benefits uh, uh, from precision medicine depend on overcoming barriers in education, accessibility, regulation, reimbursement, market economics, which is changing daily. It's a big shift now. And most importantly, though, on diversity in genetic studies. Thanks. Okay, for those that, uh, damn, Matt's leaving the room, I just want to make sure that we have that genes in your gene for the next CCTS renewal. Thinking, always thinking. Okay, um, our next speaker, thank you, this has just been um, inspiring so far, is Dave Wetter. Um, Dr. Wetter is the John M. and Karen Huntsman Pro Presidential Professor and Director, Director where we go, of the Center for Health Outcomes and Population Equity, or HOPE at um, the University of Utah and the Huntsman Cancer Institute. His work focuses on eliminating inequities in health-related behaviors through translational research. As a health psychologist, he employs um, theoretical models of addictive and cancer risk behaviors, develops and evaluates theoretically based interventions, and implements and disseminates those interventions into real, wor real world settings. His research spans the continuum from cells to soci society and focuses on high risk and underserved populations with a major focus on low socioeconomic status individuals, minorities, and women. Um, Dr. Wetter's research program has received awards from the Society of Behavioral Medicine, the American Society for Preventive Oncology, the Society for Health Psychology, Division 38 of the APA, and the University of Texas MD Anderson <laughs> Cancer Center. In addition to his research awards, and maybe most dear to my heart, Dr. Wetter was the inaugural winner of the Leading Mentor in Cancer Prevention and the winner of the Robert M. Chamberlain Outstanding Mentor Award in his previous positions at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Wetter. Good morning, and we can say that for a few more minutes. So when you invite a clinical psychologist to this, you know you're going to change gears a bit. And some of you may have heard that there are these things called apps to help you with your health. Um, thousands of them, to be honest. Unfortunately, virtually none of them are evidence-based, and consequently, virtually none of them work. So our program of research um, actually aims to lay the scientific foundation for developing just-in-time adaptive interventions, mHealth interventions, apps on your phone that can help you address health risk behaviors and other kinds of chronic disease management. And I, have to, I stole this uh, from an online class because I really like the quote at the bottom. The future of healthcare is connected patient-centered, mobile, and social, because I think it comes at a lot of the kind of work we're trying to do. So let me just say really quickly here, and I'm going to fly through this, this is really uh, a team science effort. Uh, I'm really fortunate to get to collaborate with what I call the math geeks. So it's a bunch of computer scientists, computational scientists, engineers, et cetera, on all our M health work. So what I'm going to do today is real quickly define health inequities and the social determinants of health, talk about tobacco-related inequities, because much of my work is in tobacco, because if you work in a cancer center and you're trained in addiction, 30% of all cancers are attributable to tobacco use. So huge, huge problem. And then talk about our work with one of the NIH Big Data to Knowledge Centers. Uh, ours is actually called Mobile Data to Knowledge, or MD2K. And then really get into the weeds about the environmental aspect of precision medicine. We've heard about genomics and genetics and all that all morning long. We've heard very, very little about the environment. And we're going to get into the weeds in that in some of this work and then kind of sum up. So let me just 
we haven't, we've talked about health inequities, but I wanted to just give a quick definition. World Health Organization defines health inequities as inequalities between groups, but not just an inequality. There's something unfair or unjust about the difference. And nobody can put that any better, of course, than Martin Luther King Jr., who said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So we're talking about things that have an element of social justice. About 50% of health inequities are caused by the social determinants of health. World Health Organization defines them as our, the economic, social, uh, physical environment in which we're all born, live, work, die. Couple quotes around that. In 1989, the former director of the National Cancer Institute had a really nice quote, which I think my understanding, I wasn't, I was still relatively young then, but the, apparently put some people off. Poverty is a carcinogen, which actually, being poor is bad for your health. There is virtually no disease condition on the planet where there's not a striking, striking economic gradient. And then for those of you who like a little more contemporary quote, I was in the gym listening to you know, music and this garage band from some foreign garage band had this quote, where you live should not decide whether you live or whether you die. Pointing to the giant geographic disparities and how, again, how environment is so critical in determining our health. So let's look at what's happened to tobacco use. We have done a fabulous job in tobacco control. We've reduced the prevalence, if you look at it from 1965, from about 40% to about 15% now. And in fact, the American Cancer Society, since I'm in a room with a bunch of people that you know probably like all the genetics and treatments and surgeries, the American Cancer Society estimates that about 50 to 85% of the decline in cancer deaths is due entirely to the decline in smoking prevalence. It's not due to new fancy technologies, treatments, et cetera. It's because we did a great job overall in reducing tobacco use. But I want to point something out. I can't make that. I don't know how to, oops, I don't know how to make the pointer work. So in 1965, there's very little, these are actually um, lines by educational gradient. In 1965, there's very little difference between folks' education and their likelihood of being a smoker, with the exception of college graduates. However, that decline in tobacco use over time had a very strong educational gradient. And you can see that the, the folks that had a college graduate or had some college had declined at a much faster rate, such that by the, the relative risk for the lower groups versus the the college graduates went from about 1.2 in 1965 to three and a half in 2015. So we dramatically, redu we dramatically increased health inequities, dramatically. Why? And Rick, Rick mentioned, I think it was Rick that mentioned this, you know, who's the last group that's gonna benefit from every advancement we have in technology, treatment, drugs, healthcare, et cetera. It's the underserved. If we don't pay attention to them, they will always get left behind. So we've got to do specific things to address that. And tobacco control is no exception. Relatively recent, a number of reviews have, have concluded that we did a lot around smoking cessation, but we didn't target it towards the underserved, and that actually increased inequities. When we do that, we have to target it to the groups that are least likely to be able to get the new drugs, to get the new treatments, to be advised by their physician to, to quit smoking. So our goal in the group I work with is to use technology and to specifically target underserved groups to try to help them make sure they keep up with all the benefits of modern healthcare. And so we work with a lot of <laughs> safety net healthcare systems, federally qualified health centers, et cetera, to try to do that. And we work very heavily around technology because we're trying to look for low resource, low cost approaches. You know, you can't come in there with, you know, couple million dollar imaging machines with, you know, you've got to go in with approaches that um, an FQHC, which is surviving year to year on, you know, putting together a, a funding source, we've got to think, have things that can actually help 
them treat their patients, not just people at academic medical centers and wealth, you know, and, and the insured. So, our group, again, I mentioned, um, we're really, really heavily focused on the environment and real time, real world, lived experience. And so our model that we sort of go after is sort of is fairly simple. We try to use on-body human sensing technology wearables. You know, you've all probably half the room's got some kind of a heart rate monitoring watch on right now. Um, everybody's got a smartphone. Um, and so we can use those technologies to actually stream physiology. We can use those technologies. We take a GPS ping in our work every five seconds. So we know exactly where they are. We periodically interrupt people during the day to ask about their emotion. Although we're getting to the point where we're going to be able to detect your emotion without having anything to do with that with self-report. We're trying to sense as much information as possible passively. So that it, we just, it just comes in and we know it's happening constantly. We then use machine learning approaches, dynamic prediction modeling, etc., to try to understand um, risk for whatever it is you're trying to address. So we can now passively detect stress, smoking, alcohol use, etc. And so we're trying to actually develop the algorithms that will let us know when a person's starting to get stressed. And then we can use that information to intervene. And because we're passively sensing, we can see whether the intervention actually makes a difference and then adapt it for each person and each moment in time. And these things are likely to change for people over time as well. So that's our general model. We're doing that in our big data center, but we're also doing it in a number of, uh, of related R01s. Um, and so let's, I'm going to just kind of walk you through linking the social determinants of health to smoking cessation. So I'm going to show you this graph, kind of walk you through it. Um, and I'm going to show you this kind of graph over and over and over where I have um, you know, the outcome on the bottom, or, or the outcome on the vertical axis, in this case it's smoking abstinence, and time across the horizontal axis. I'm always going to show you the underserved group with the blue line. So here you can see that this is people going through the, the process of a quit attempt. And you can see that the individuals that are in the lower income group are much less likely to quit. You can also see that that holds true whether you're looking at education, whether you're looking at wh whether they have insurance or not, and whether you're looking at whether they're employed or not. And the thing I want to point out here is this is not access, because that's the first thing everybody goes to to explain health inequities. Access is critical, but it is not everything. These folks face a different world than we do, and we're going to kind of go through some of that. In this study, everybody gets treated by us with behavioral treatment and pharmacotherapy. So everybody's got the exact same treatment. So why does having lower income make a difference when you're, all, you're getting the exact same treatment? So I want to talk a little bit again about the environment. So here's where we are using our data over time. And we've just aggregated it over the course of a quit attempt to show you um, what the kind of environmental influences that smokers face. So here again, the blue line is the lower SES group. And they are exposed to much more smoking in terms of whether smoking is allowed in the environment or not, whether there are no smoking policies. Cigarettes are much more available and they're exposed to many more smokers. For those of you that know about what happens in the brain of an addict when they're exposed to smoking cues, you will know that it lights up. So we have a huge problem here in that our low SES folks are facing a much different world when they try to quit than our folks that are at higher SES. So we've got to develop, and we need to address this in multiple ways. We need to address it via policy, uh, smoking restrictions that not are just at the University of Utah and your academic campuses, but at a construction site or in a factory. Um, there's all sorts of things we need to do around policy. And then la the last thing I want to show you here is a little bit different, but um, I'm not able to make this work. Whoops. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the old-fashioned pointer. Uh, this, this is a picture of a convenience store in a low SES neighborhood. This is, 
these are everywhere. If you go into a poor neighborhood in any city in the country, you will see mom and pop shops. You will not see any flagship grocery stores. There are a very, very tiny group of things that are advertised in a low SES neighborhood. There's cigarettes, cigars, e-cigarettes, booze, and gambling. What else is there there? So if you live, so I just, I moved up here from, from Houston not long ago. If you're in the third ward, low SES, predominantly African American neighbor, neighborhood in Houston, there is about three of these per block. If you're in River Oaks, the wealthy neighborhood, there's nothing but a flagship Whole Foods, um, whatever, other flagship grocery stores. They sell cigarettes, but you don't even know it. The grocery stores you go to, they sell cigarettes. You don't even know it. If you live in a poor neighborhood, this is what you're exposed to. Why does it matter? It matters because we've shown that simply how close you live to a tobacco retail outlet predicts your likelihood of relapse. And not only that, but using our real-time data, we, we can show that how close you are to a tobacco outlet is correlated with your craving which actually makes sense if you're a psychologist and you understand conditioning. So, very different environments and worlds that low SES individuals have to navigate. What happens when you have to navigate those kinds of worlds? Well, the traditional things we think about are also then impacted. They encounter much more stress, negative affect, they encounter less positive affect, and they have less motivation to quit. Not surprising if you're facing that kind of a world. That sucks your self-regulatory capacity down to the bone. So I'm just gonna, now I'm just going to show you some moment by moment. Those were where I just sort of aggregated data over days. So what happens when people encounter a stressor in the real world? And so we just simply ask people. We ping them with your phones. Your, if you were in one of our studies, there would be about six of you right now. Your phone's going off, and we're asking you a series of questions. And we ask you whether, you've been, since the last assessment, and they're typically a couple hours apart, have you encountered a new stressor or an ongoing stressor? And what we find is that 45% of the time, they say they've encountered a stressor, either a new, an ongoing, or both. What does that do to the likelihood of relapsing? Again, remember now, I just showed you that low SES people are much more likely to encounter a stressor. It about doubles your likelihood of relapse. So again, really different world to navigate. Now if you're a minority, you have another thing you've got to deal with. So this is a sample of Latino smokers. And we just simply did the same kind of thing, but we asked them, since the last assep uh, uh, assessment, have you encountered an episode of discrimination? And we found that about a little less than 4% of the time, they reported that they had been discriminated against. What happens if you report that you're discriminated against? Well, it about doubles your likelihood of lapsing as well. And I want to make one really, really critical point here. And that is, remember, these are moments. So we're doing moments multiple, multiple, multiple times across the course of a day. So what this translates to is that about one time a week, these if you extrapolate the numbers, about once a week these folks are reporting an episode of discrimination. So keep extrapolating. It's 50 times a year, that's 500 times in 10 years. If you don't think that has an impact on individuals, you know, I, there's no, God help us. So, uh, you know, it, it's, these folks are facing a different world than many of us are. So, you know, I've been talking about all these risks. The other thing we know is that um, people are experiencing positive emotions too. And we looked at um, whether, whether these positive emotions are actually protective. And what we found is that when we look at the positive emotion that you're experiencing today, we look at, you know, your trajectory. These are actually individual trajectories. So these are, you know, and we fit, we fit cur our, our, the math geeks fit curves to them. And then we look at the mean levels and slopes across the day. And what we find is that the mean level and the slope of positive affect actually is protective against a lapse the following day. And when we look a little further, we find that actually happiness is actually the, one of the, the main protective positive emotions over and above other ones. So 
one of the things we need to think about in addressing addiction and tobacco use that we've talked a lot about but we don't do much about, which is um, enhancing positive emotion and positive uh, reinforcers other than drug use. So I'm going to real quickly here, so you know, I just sort of gave you a little hint of what trajectories are. These are just fake patients, but we've looked at trajectories across a wide, wide variety of factors, and trajectories make a huge difference in the likelihood that people are going to lapse. But what's exciting about right now in science is that we are to the point where we can actually look at people's trajectories in real time now and start to detect what it is that's causing the problem. So for example, we know if they're getting near a tobacco outlet because we know where they are every five seconds. We, know, we can actually, my colleague who's a computational science, scientist at Georgia Tech is developing the technology with like Google Glass kinds of things where they can, we can detect alcohol ads on TV through pattern recognition. So we're getting to the point now where we can actually have somebody with a suite of wearables and really understand what's going on for them and the kinds of things they're exposed to. We've never had this kind of opportunity before. Not even remotely. It's insane. It's incredibly big brotherish, but it's, <laughs> it's mind-bogglingly bogglingly informative. So, um, and then just the last thing is I want to show you ma the magnitude. You know, I've been showing you individual moments and all that. And, you know, we, again, we're doing all these machine learning stuff and dynamic prediction modeling and I am the stat idiot. And it's like, it's like what the hell does that mean in terms of the, the actual risk, the absolute magnitude? Give me something I can understand. So, my colleague divided we took three triggers that we know are empirically related to smoking laps. Whether you're experiencing negative emotions, whether you're drinking, um, and uh, whether other smokers are around. Because all of those predict the likelihood of laps. And we just, divide, we just took individual situations and we characterized them on the presence or absence of that factor. You know, was, were you experiencing negative affect? Yes, no. We, we did, you know, based on, we did some splits. And then we looked at, so you can think now, every situation is characterized by zero triggers, one of those triggers is present, two or all three. And we looked at, if you were in a specific situation, these are, these are portions of the situation, what's the likelihood that it would, what's the likelihood that this situation would lead to a, a relapse? And you can see when none of the triggers are present, the likelihood is dang near zero. It's less than half a percent. When you add one trigger, it starts to go up. You add two trigger, it goes up a little bit more. You add three triggers, it goes up even further. So if you actually do the math here on these proportions, that means that about one out of every 250 situations where there are no triggers present results in a lapse versus one, about one in five when all three are. It's a 50-fold difference. And I want to point that out because as you're doing all your genetics and genomics, don't forget how unbelievably powerful context is. We've got to address this if we want to help people at least with respect to health risk behaviors. So just to sum up, you know, inequity is a huge, huge public health burden. And I put the second, the last half of that sentence in there because we talk about it all the time and we forget to bring it down. These are real people who are suffering because of health inequities. It's not just a public health burden. People are suffering and dying. Profound gradient by socioeconomic status and the social determinants of health. And in the U.S., in fact, around tobacco use, 58% of the SES gradient in health is attributable to tobacco use. Context is huge. I hope, you know, I've made that point. I was at a giant biological institution for almost 20 years, so I felt like I would have a big chip on my shoulder, and I'm always telling everybody, context is huge. We're not going to solve the world's social ills without addressing a lot of these kinds of issues. And then, again, really, really exciting time uh, where we have uh, unprecedented, unprecedented ability to look into people's real-time, real-world experiences. And highlighting what several other people have said, um, we've got 
to have precision medicine efforts that don't just get disseminated broadly, but get very specifically targeted to underserved groups. So, thank you. Okay, so Dr. Weather will now be talk, uh, joined by Dr. Um, Hughes Halbert and Dr. Kittles for our question and answer session, which Adam has told me we have 23 minutes for, at which point lunch will happen. Awesome. Please remember that Bridget will have microphones for you. Do we have any questions for this group? Dr. Morris. Just throw it over the spiral. He's kidding. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I'm kidding. Thank you, uh, Alan Morris, of the Department of Medicine. Question for Dr. Wetter. Uh, very interesting approach uh, that incorporates a lot of uh, psychological imperatives. Have you considered extending that to studying clinicians so that a better understanding of the contextual determinants of clinician decision making and why clinicians either agree to adopt or decline to follow guidelines, protocols, and so forth, information that's never addressed basically in clinical methods uh, could be added what? to this mix. You, you've actually, so part of, I, um, I, you know, we use technology. We actually do, a, we have a whole other line of research which is actually in primary care using electronic health record. And what we try to do with clinicians is not give you any option, <coughs> is we try to use really, um, we try to use what's called, we use behavioral economics, so there's a real famous book called uh, Nudge, if people might have heard about it. It's basically setting up the world so that the right thing automatically happens. So for instance, with tobacco use, we try to, do, in every case we can, use what we call a best practice alert, which forces well, number one, it forces folks to do a, smoke, a tobacco use assessment, and if, they, if, it's, if it's positive, it's a best practice alert that tries to connect them automatically to treatment, and that's, you can't move forward without that. Um, and we try to actually take the burden, though, off the clinician and the patient for any referral. So it does an automatic connection to treatment. The treatment provider then contacts the smoker and sets things up. Because, so in, in, it's actually, um, we, we're trying to take away your options because we recognize how unbelievably busy clinicians are to address all the kinds of things that like a, a public health person like myself wants them to address if that kind of gets at it. Um, but, uh, yeah, a little bit, but... Um. And, and while Bridget is walking that direction, I, I was just struck when, when Dr. Kittles was talking that, that we talk about Irish Americans and we talk about, you know, German Americans and then we talk about African Americans, but we rarely talk about, like, Gambian Americans, or and and uh, does that distinction in in lumping play into the the ancestry discussion? Do you think? Yeah, yeah it does. I think historically, um, uh, African folks of African descent have been um, pulled together, and uh, and and for many reasons. I mean, you know, politically, but then also, you know, historically, it, it's been problematic for the population to even understand where the ancestry comes from. So um, it's, been, um, uh, it's been easy to do that, but it's been problematic at the level of, of you know, in terms of biomedical research and, yeah. and, and clinical sort of utility. So, um, but yeah, so we're trying to move away from that. And one of the ways in which we can is by using ancestry. I'm not saying strip away these identifiers, but what I'm saying is that, um, you know, because self-report does have some meaning, right. significant uh, import, but uh, ancestry is a much more useful sort of practical variable. Okay, um, thanks. I was really interested in Dr. Kittle's statement about how race is a really crude proxy for both sure. genetics and environment, and I think you gave a really good example of how to address that from a genetic perspective, but my head was going with, okay, how do we address that from the environmental perspective? And so the next talk was really helpful in kind of getting me to think about that. Um, 
But my question is, I think Dr. Wetter was getting at the idea of changing context, but I think for smoking that's really relevant, but in not all medical contexts would you want to change sociocultural factors. So how do you, kind of thinking about the future of precision medicine, address sociocultural factors in giving more precise treatment to people and kind of what you guys are thinking about that. I would say sometimes you do want to change. I mean, in, in low SES populations, there's uh, social norms around um, uh, high-risk behavior that's very different than in other populations. And uh, I, I think um, in the, some of the, so in that context, I would think it's personally, I think it would, we'd want to change social norms. Um, that might not be, uh, you know, the same for, you know, perhaps other cultural groups, but. Um, but there, there may also be options that, you know, for example, around diet, where particular cultural groups have traditionally really high fat diets, and you might want to try to change the norms around eating, you know, like, although fat now, you know, who knows with diet. Uh, you know, now fat's okay again, hallelujah. Um, so I, sometimes I think it might not be terrible, but. I no, I, I agree with you. I think, I think uh, that's what an intervention is, right? It's a change, right? And, and so if it's, if it's a behavioral, it's, if it's, let's say it's a health behavior or whatever, then you, know, you may have to uh, 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 attempt to make some of, those, some of those changes. But I think that the, 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 the bottom line, sort of the point we were all trying to make was, is that there's a context in which all of this stuff is operating from. And whether it's, a, it's a, at, a, at a population level or historical level, and I use the term local experiences. Local experiences, local histories matter in a lot of this. And so often we, we forget that. You know, we, we think the patient comes in to the, to the um, physician's office, uh, to the clinician's office, and they're all coming from the same context, and that's not the case. We have to, we have to try to contextualize more because we can use that information to help lead to better outcomes. Um, uh, when, when we do more, po when we do population-based work, it is it is population-based um, um, uh, research. It is so important to really get sort of like almost like the ethnography of the population um, into the model because um, it, 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 they're so vastly different, and and, and it allow for more robust uh, analyses. That's not me. <laughs> Does that make sense, what I'm saying? The context matters. Local experience, local history matters. While, while we're moving, I think we're going to move back over that direction. While we're moving over that direction, I, I was struck by the by sort of two two concepts that came up, and and was wondering if Dr. Hughes Halbert might be able to address other people's thoughts here. Um, Dr. Kittles talked about the differences in mu opioid receptors that may make people more or less prone to to treatment, and Dr. Wetter talked about the the, the social cues within an environment um, that may make people more or less prone to relapse, and how. Does that, how does that inform our policy as we're talking about um, treatment programs, prison, all, uh, and other things that as, as, as we get into sociocultural um, and different racial disparities? <laughs> Rick distracted me by taking a picture. <laughs> yeah, you know you Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one, but, um, <laughs> but I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, as, as we're talking, one of the things that strikes me is that all of our talks have really, as Rick said, emphasized the, important of con the importance of context. Um, I think we're challenged to understand individual context on a, in a robust, meaningful way. I think we've heard some examples, um, natural language processing, the phenome, as ways to begin thinking about developing tools and systems for doing that. I think as we begin thinking about policy changes, one of the recommendations I would make is that those, um, that policy needs to be developed um, 
with a diverse group of stakeholders. I think that we cannot develop policies um, without including individual patients, um, providers, um, public health providers, psychologists, geneticists, um, the entire spectrum of, of groups that have um, that will contribute to what the policy should be. I think that that's one of the things that has been really challenging as we've developed policies is that they are developed in sort of a, in, in absence of the context. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Rachel, for letting me, uh, give me a second opportunity. Uh, Dr. Kittles mentioned something I thought was very important and fundamental, and that is the danger of converting continuous variables that we encounter throughout life in many uh, ways uh, to categoricals right up front. For example, the issue of black and white in the United States is anything but black and white. I mean, when I was an elementary school student, I learned that the skin color of Caucasians from the subcontinent was in some groups much darker than the skin color of blacks from Africa. So what does skin color do? Well, it's a continuous variable that we mistakenly, up front, convert to a categorical, and that is a huge barrier to understanding. So I liked very much uh, what you uh, said. Uh, and I'd like to make a second comment about context. Uh, it, in that regard, uh, I refer to some information I got years ago from the environmental psychology literature. Uh, what we're talking about is a transactional unit. You have a patient in a context interacting with the environment or also with clinicians. And the outcome of importance is never the patient. I mean, asking what the outcome of a patient with cystic fibrosis is, is a meaningless statement unless you tell me whether the patient is born with the gene in Salt Lake City or in the hinterglands of South Africa. In Salt Lake City, the patient has a pulmonary disorder of teenage and adult years. In the hinterlands of South Africa, the same patient with the same genetic defect has a lethal neonatal gastrointestinal disease. So it makes no difference. It, it's about as helpful as asking, what's the normal dress code without knowing where you're going? I mean, it's a silly question. So I'm uh, indebted to all of you. I think it was a very interesting presentation. Seth? Thanks. Thank you. Oh, up in the back. Um, so Brian Jackson, pathology. So trying to connect this up to the study of, of diagnostic errors where there's a lot of discussion about debiasing and, and cognitive errors and, and so forth. Um, personalized medicine has historically had a lot of emphasis on acquiring more and more data to, to produce more and more richer context. But um, to, to what extent is personalized medicine about correcting the context or, or, or using the data to um, to de-bias or, or, or get past misperceptions that are, are counterproductive? That's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, I started my talk by, by saying that there was this tension that's being created as we accumulate more and more knowledge and, and, and data and the technology is, is, is advancing. Um, uh, we, we, we owe it to ourselves to, to, to clean <laughs> clean the data as we go along. Um, I'm not sure the, the, how much of that is happening, but it should be. And I would just add that I think it's really important to ask the question of what is the data that needs to be collected? I think there's a lot of information that can be collected, could be collected, and will be collected, but whether or not that's the right data I think is yet to be determined. Um, I think we've heard a lot of talks about collecting data in real time, moment to moment, um, which is really exciting because that's been one of the, in my mind, one of the significant deficits about the work that we've done uh, in health psychology and behavioral science because we, we sort of get information after the fact. And being able to determine 
what's happening as it's happening, I think, is a major step forward. I think the same can be um, applied in the clinical context. There's a lot of work that's been done to understand uh, patient-provider communication. Again, after the fact, but if we begin to think about uh, a precision approach to understanding the nature and quality of patient-provider interaction and how that uh, impacts outcomes and treatments decisions, I think is would be really important. But again, you know, I think we have to start from you know what our conceptual model is and to help guide our thought process about what types of data need to be collected. Yeah. I was going to say something, but go ahead. I, the microphone, so I'll wait. <laughs> I, I, uh, I I can collect data in real time. I mean, I could. I don't have to ping everybody right now. I could just ask them. Uh, I don't even have to ask them. I could just look at them. And I, they're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hurry. So let's hurry up. That's, that's a good like cue. Okay, so we have Dr. Fagerlin and Dr. Van Dries, and then I think we'll break for lunch. Okay, great. Um, you, you, all three of you t talked in very different ways about the role of stress in healthcare. Um, Dr. Wetter talked about it in terms of smoking, but I was really interested, Dr. Hughes Halbert, when you were talking about stress in prostate cancer and their experience of, of stress, and then the NLP work that you presented about the reports of stress. And how do you think that, I mean, we could talk the rest of the day about this, but just briefly thinking about that in terms of these different clinical conditions, prostate cancer or, or diabetes or other chronic illnesses, the role of stress and, and what we can do to address some of those things through the disparities lens. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll answer that by saying that I think stress is, um, on the one hand, acknowledged as an important variable, um, both in the psychological literature as well as the um, more basic science literature. I think one of the questions that has, has emerged from the disparities field is that there are stressors that are experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, people internalize that. They process that on a physiological basis. I don't know that we understand the ways in which that occurs. Um, there's some in intriguing studies which have been looking at um, the endoplasmic reticulum as a mechanism for sort of activating the cellular stress response, which I think is really fascinating. But those are really important questions that we're just beginning to understand. I think um, Dave's work is providing some really important insights about where and how people experience environmental stressors. Um, our work is looking at the ways in which um, social stress and sort of um, exposure to stress in a laboratory setting uh, predicts immune responses. And so we're beginning to do that. Um, but we're just, again, beginning. And so it's, it's exciting, but also, you know, we are at the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. And we've been, we've been talking all morning about um, prediction and, and telling the future. Do any of you have insights as the best ways for us to present that information to to patients, to the people who are, are, are at risk, so that it is empowering and not uh, sort of giving them the sense of inevitability and powerlessness over what's about to happen in their lives, whether it's prostate cancer or smoking or any other outcome. I think there are a lot of good models about how to convey information about um, risk, information about genetics, risk, information about behavioral risk factors, so they're really useful models. I mean, one that comes to my mind is the amazing amount of work and the quality work that's been done um, with genetic counseling and testing. I'm not suggesting that everyone would need to go through that level of intervention, but those, I think, can you can extract some pearls and some key best practices from that. Uh, Andrew's work has been really phenomenal in understanding how to communicate risk um, in ways through decision aids and other types of intervention. And so I think there's a, you know, the good thing is that there's a lot of um, useful models that have been demonstrated to have sufficient evidence um, and efficacy in terms of ones that we could sort of begin to think about developing as a way to um, apply it and helping people understand precision medicine and how it can apply to their health care as they're making decisions. I want to thank all of our panelists this morning. Um, Unless I just...
uh, unless I just cut someone off, and oh, yeah. then I'll apologize. Um, and uh, lunch is served in the same place that breakfast. Lunch is served in the same place that breakfast was served, and we'll reconvene back here at 1.30. You still get an hour, Adam says. 